Cave Story was a Metroidvania-inspired indie game developed by a single person by the name of Daisuke Amaya. He made all the artwork, designed the entire engine with nothing but some knowledge of C++, and made the entire soundtrack with no formal music training or knowledge of music theory. Despite the insane amount of variables working against him, Daisuke, through sheer passion and artistic vision, was able to string together not just any game, but a complete masterpiece that revolutionized the entire gaming industry by proving to everyone that you don't need a gigantic studio to create a good game. For those who are unaware, this game has inspired just about every indie game that could, would then inspire our modern indie game scene. There is a sort of degrees of separation effect that returns all indie games to Cave Story, no matter how modern or seemingly distant the connection might be. It was Cave Story Plus and its re-release on the Nintendo Switch include several graphical and musical remasters for the entire game, as well as additional content. Even more so with the Switch, which adds even more graphical updates and the option to change the game's soundtrack between even more remasters. I like to discuss the development of Cave Story as well as Cave Story 3D, as it's an extremely interesting topic, but I have to get this show on the road, so that'll be a separate video. Let's begin. Cave Story begins with a transmission from Kazuma Sakamoto, who's trying to contact his sister, Sue Sakamoto. Holy. He's trapped in a room with a computer and a non-functional teleporter. However, Sue isn't responding for whatever reason. Then the game starts. The transmission was the story, and here's the cave. Your options are rather limited. You can walk around, jump, look up, and interact with things by pressing down. The enemies in the first cave are designed around your inability to fight back. The beanbag critters can jump towards you, but are placed in areas you can completely avoid them in unless you jump down to wherever they are and don't jump over them. The bats, on the other hand, act more as platforming challenges by impeding where you're going to be moving, and you have to time when you're jumping to avoid them. You can also find a life capsule, which will increase your total health. This is important, as your total health at this point leaves a lot to be desired. The spikes will instantly kill you, and the enemies will do a clean third of your health. This game also does not pull punches with the platforming challenges whatsoever. They start out challenging, and throughout the entire game remain challenging by using a combination of small platforms, big gaps, and factors such as how much of a running start you need, or how much you need to hold the jump button in order to extend your jump. This is particularly interesting to me, because these segments stand out in difficulty to such a degree where it's actually somewhat challenging even to a third or fourth replay which can keep replays interesting as earlier areas are usually seen as more boring to higher skilled players as they've already experienced and have gotten good with the gameplay mechanics in there. However, they're still challenging at this point, leaving a much more engaging replay. There's a sleeping gunsmith at the end of the cave and you can grab his gun. You also get another intermission with Kazuma where he's attempting to get into contact with Sue. Your first firearm is the Polar Star which fires a slim projectile for a small distance. It deals a small amount of damage, but is good enough for this point. However, you can pick up candy corns from dead enemies. These act as experience points, and if you get enough of them, you can upgrade your weapons. If you get damaged with XP, the amount of health you lose is proportional to the amount of XP you also lose, and that can end up actually leveling down your weapons. What I admire most about this unique design idea is that it completely destroys an issue I find with uh, Metroid and Castlevania games, where you get enough health upgrades, and then you can basically just power through some bosses and enemies by absorbing damage and using that to completely cheese encounters. However, trying to do so in Cave Story is an easy way to get a quick level down or two, and do less damage, and also have your strategy be less effective and probably die as a result because enemies and bosses in Cave Story tend to do a lot of damage. As you exit the first cave, you get one last transmission from Kazuma, where he states that he's so hungry that he ate a cockroach. LOL, just kidding though. I find this dialogue particularly interesting because it manages to accurately portray both internet usage and internet dialect, which is incredibly impressive as there is practically zero media from the early 2000s capable of doing such a thing in an accurate manner without either patronizing or completely misunderstanding the millennial generation. Then two rabbit people called Mimiga are arguing about whether or not they should protect Sue, most likely the same Sue Sakamoto that Kazumo is trying to reach. Their names are King and Toroko. A person called the Doctor has been accosting their village and taking Mimiga in search of Sue. However, you then fall right in between them and Toroko walk runs off. You can speak to King for more background information on the village and what just happened, or you can just completely ignore him, which I assume a lot of players after multiple playthroughs will do because they don't need that extra background information because they already know what's going on. 
or maybe if they missed it the first time, they can come back and check the dialogue later. This type of variance definitely adds to replay value. There's a reservoir right next to where you fell, and you can speak to the fisherman there about Sue. Apparently, she washed up by the reservoir from outside the village and is considered somewhat of a pariah by King, while the rest of the villagers seem to be rather indifferent to her. At least that last part is what you can get by speaking to other villagers. The dialogue in Cave Story always is able to provide background information on the setting of the game, backstory of it, and some miscellaneous gameplay pointers. In the reservoir, there's a locket. Upon leaving with it, Toroko appears and is rather scared of your presence and runs off. Toroko then has another confrontation with King, where she runs into him, knocks him over his feet, and runs off. From here, you can either explore the rest of the village or run after her. There's some things I want to highlight first, though. The first thing is a chest beyond another rather difficult platforming challenge, containing the map system. There's something inscribed on the map system, too. So long as you always maintain a sense of exploration, you will someday find the way out. That is my hope. I'll discuss what this means in further detail later, but essentially this is Daisuke Amaya saying to you, the player, that if you use this map and remain explorative, only then can you find the true ending of the game. There's also the Yamashita farm, where the Mimiga village's food is grown in the form of flowers. They grow white and yellow flowers, but not red flowers, because according to the farmer here, they cause instant death. This is actually incorrect, uh, because as we'll find out later, the Mimika don't actually know the true usage of the red flower, but only that it's really, really bad for them. What's interesting here is that this uses a little bit of uh, writing technique where rumors of something form that are incorrect in a way to have it either corrected for both the audience and whoever created the rumors, or to generally establish that different cultures and separate people will come up with their own lore, folk tales, and rumors like this. Back to the main story, there's a house owned by Mimiga named Arthur, who was killed by the doctor, but the door is locked. Right next to it is an empty shack, where Toroko ambushes you, and just ends up running around like a child before getting knocked down. Afterwards, she explains that she thought you were the doctor, and that the doctor himself occasionally comes around to the village to kidnap and kill Mimiga. Then, a toaster named Balrog breaks into the shack, a witch named Misery teleports in, and Toroko identifies both of them as the doctor's henchmen. What I particularly love about this encounter is that it shows how amazingly Cave Story is written. Misery and Balrog have excellent chemistry with each other as she insults him, takes Toroko as prisoner, mistaking her for Sue, and then Balrog explains about having to clean up what she leaves behind. Speaking about this, Balrog is so fed up that he actually asks if you want to fight with him or not. And if you say no, he'll just leave. If you do fight with him, this is the first boss. He'll start by running towards you and occasionally jumping. His jumps will counteract any attempt to jump over him by colliding with you, to which he'll throw you, dealing a chunk of damage. Depending on how much you've explored, the damage can be far less meaningful. Because of how the game's set up, you can only have as much XP at this point as you left the first cave with, meaning that the damage to your XP will be much more detrimental. The arena is set up in a way that lets you jump over him safely with the block to the right, but if you're on the left, it becomes more of a challenge, as you'll have to gauge when Balrog jumps as he's running towards you, so you don't collide with him in the air. However, he'll be running all the way from the right side, giving you enough distance to deduce when he will and won't do a jump. This is a fairly forgiving fight that demonstrates a lot of insight to game development. We'll see a lot more like this. After defeating or ignoring Balrog, you can make it back to Jack, the second in command of the village, who for the past while has been guarding the cemetery, so that giant mushrooms don't escape or anyone enters it and get killed by said giant mushrooms. However, he quickly enters the assembly hall to meet with King after hearing the news about Toroko. In the cemetery is a tombstone dedicated to Arthur, Toroko's brother, and on it is the key to his house. In the house, there's a computer highlighted by how much it sticks out from the rest of the environment, where you can read the end of Kazuma and Sue's chat logs and enable teleporting to the Egg Corridor. Then you hop into the suspiciously teleporter-shaped contraption and get whisked off to the first major area of the game, the Egg Corridor. Cave Story is broken up into these areas where progression in them is very open and free like a Metroidvania game, and you're able to go to and from them like a standard Metroidvania game. A major block of them are also connected to each other. It's sort of like a slightly less linear version of Metroid Fusion sectors. Granted, you'll still know where to go at all times, but instead of being ordered between individual objectives, you're exploring through a large overarching story. Some of 
Some things that make the Egg Corridor unique are its architecture and enemies. The design is essentially a straight shot to the opposite end, but with many platforming challenges and formations that allow for alternative ways to move forward, along with several sequestered off items like life capsules. The name of the game is Staying Up High by learning the platforming capabilities of your character, and if you fall down at the bottom layer, there is a white fuzzy critter that is more than happy to instantly kill you. In the egg corridor, there is of course eggs being incubated, two of which can be entered and are not in fact eggs, but rooms which contain something important for progression. One has a keycard and another has a computer you need the keycard for, and it will then open the gates to the end of the egg corridor. You can enter these eggs really whenever you want, as they're strewn about the center and end of the area, but are also highlighted in the egg observatory room in case you miss them, which is very helpful for first-time players. Before venturing too far off, you'll encounter a hot-headed Mimiga who's being accosted and kidnapped by a larger and much more malevolent Mimiga. There's also an egg observation room, which nudges you to go into the eggs that I previously mentioned, because the development in them is listed as abnormal, seeing as, well, they're not eggs, so obviously, since obviously an IT room is going to have much different conditions from a functional embryonic development chamber. Additionally, there's also a chest containing a missile launcher. The missile launcher launches missiles that deal an incredible amount of damage. However, at level 3, the missiles are rather slow and have a wind-up time before shooting off. This means you'll have to use the timing and positioning of your enemy's movements and attacks to your advantage when firing missiles at them, so that the missiles don't miss, as you have a limited amount of missile ammo. However, you can pick up missiles from dead enemies. At the end of the egg corridor is a giant Namiga who states that a professor is very important and that it's very important that he tests the eggs. And since we've gotten too close to the eggs, he must kill us. Then a boss fight starts against Igor. It isn't too difficult, he'll walk around the room and maybe punch you, then fire off a load of projectiles occasionally. The projectiles are rather numerous and can easily block shots if you lose a level or two. Igor has quite a large health bar too, and can take a fair amount of firepower to take him down. But he can be taken down if you identify when to jump over him correctly and when to fire at him, which shouldn't be too hard as his movement is almost identical to Balrog's, albeit much slower. There's a door leading to a dark room. In there, the Mimiga from before can be found. She wakes up and finishes her abrasive speech from earlier before realizing she's been knocked out for quite a long time now. She asks if you've saved her, and you're given the chance to answer, varying her dialogue between different overconfident responses. However, she realizes that the room they're in contains egg number 00, which can be hatched immediately to escape the island we're on. However, it's locked behind a password, a password that her big brother could crack if he were here. She leaves, presumably to find him, and urges you to come along with. From here, you can rush back through the egg corridor, or perhaps grab anything you've previously missed. Back at Arthur's house, Kazuma is speaking with Sue, who is revealed to be the Mimiga we just rescued. She speaks with her brother Kazuma and asks him questions about his condition while telling him about how she's been doing. Kazuma is trapped in a shack located in a place called the Bushlands, and he has no contact with their mother. He then sends a signal to teleport to the Bushlands when Sue is taken into custody by King and Jack, as they hold her responsible for t getting Toroko into this whole mess with Misery, where she was mistakenly identified as Sue. She's placed in a holding cell and tells us that we need to get Kazuma in the Bushlands, where we're about to go next. At the Bushlands, a Mimiga named Santa is here, and he has dropped the keys to his house and asks for assistance. The Bushlands are filled with hills and tall platforming challenges that use a combination of verticality and horizontal planes to make large and open areas that can make combat really interesting. For example, these critters will jump up high when activated and begin hovering towards you. If you fire a missile at them, the first one will strike, and more likely than not, the others will miss. You can use the hills to your advantage when dealing with airborne enemies. There are these mold ghost enemies, which fire a projectile when attacked that goes straight through the hills, forcing you to retreat to a position higher than the ghost. These factors, alongside the unique areas I'm going to talk about later, make the bushlands very unique and make it stick out a lot. After grabbing Santa's key, he'll invite you over to his house, where he'll give you the fireball. The fireball shoots a ball of fire that immediately arcs downwards, then bounces along the surface of the ground. This makes it incredibly good at scaling up and down the hills around the bushlands, and firing at enemies from above platforms. The fireball deals a lot of damage, too, with high DPS, but you can only have four projectiles on screen at, at a time once it's at its max level. However, if you get right up close to the enemy, it can turn very strong because the fireball dissipate after hitting something, meaning that you can effectively fire it as fast as you press the button. 
You'll also need jellyfish juice to continue forth, as you'll need to put out the fireplace in this house ahead. It's gotten from the big jellyfish, which now spawns. I don't really like this stretch of the game because it's a lot of running around and killing this big jellyfish over and over, and it can get pretty tiresome. Some solutions for this would be having the jellyfish spawn the moment you enter the bushlands, or being able to trigger them before bringing Santa's key back, as it would streamline going through and back the main area outside of Santa's house, then going back out again. Two things you can grab with jellyfish juice are the charcoal from Santa's house, which will be important later, and the bubbline from the Mimiga village, which is a new weapon. The bub line is honestly kind of a joke weapon at first. It fires bubbles that do as much damage as you'd expect. Maybe a bit more. Then it turns into a bubble machine gun that has severe ammo damage and speed issues. It has ammo that recharges over time, but it only recharges once you have it out. So you have to kind of have it out to wait for it to recharge, almost like taking time to reload in a, in a magazine in an FPS game. At max level, it surrounds you in bubbles that act as a shield against enemies and will automatically fire, and can all be fired at once by letting go of the fire button. It still does take ammo, and it does take a bit of time to recharge, but when given the proper scenario, the bub line can be easily more powerful than even the missile launcher. Although, it doesn't take much XP to get it to its max, and therefore will often revert to level 2 if hit by one or two attacks. With this arsenal at hand, the Bushlands' layout now becomes even more interesting, as the unique architecture creates many potential use cases for all four of your weapons. Now, with another instance of the jellyfish juice, we can put out the fire at Chaco's house and enter the second half of the bushlands. There's a shack with a locked door and an open crevice. Through that crevice, we can speak to Kazuma, who says that he's locked in but has a key that could maybe open the door. However, the door has no keyhole. But we can use this key from that he gives us to enter a different shack. In here, we can turn on the power to air fans and also activate a security robot who is going to terminate us. However, Balrog bursts through the ceiling, crushes the robot, and talks to us for a second. Apparently, the doctor found out that Misery kidnapped Toroko instead of Sue. She was given a beatdown of epic proportion because of that. The way Balrog nonchalantly smiles and laughs about this, honestly, is really funny in a horribly dark way. The same way Misery is constantly abusing Balrog throughout the game. Anyways, this fight's a bit different. Balrog will jump and flutter for a bit, then smash the floor and fire balls in two directions. Although, being close enough to shoot him is a bit more of a challenge given the range of your weapons and the speed of their projectiles. After a while, he'll stop fluttering and just jump, which makes it a lot harder to position yourself and shoot away the balls he fires. If you get close with the fireball, you can deal a lot of damage. However, the trajectory of the fireball makes it very hard to shoot away the balls Balrog spawns. Anyways, he gets beaten, retreats, and you can comically pull the crushed robot out of the ground. He's a bit calmed down now after being crushed and wishes to repay us, but he only knows how to make bombs. However, that's just what we need because with a bomb we can blow down the door and help Kazuma. In order to make a bomb, we need charcoal, jellyfish juice, and gum base. Charcoal and jellyfish juice can be gotten by going back to the start and killing the jellyfish queen yet again because we didn't get enough of that already. It would be way less tedious if there was another big jellyfish in the second half. Anyways, telling Kazuma about this, he says that he doesn't know what gum base is, but found a key labeled gum. At the end of the bushlands is a platforming challenge using propeller fans and a door unlocked by the gum key. After collecting the gum base, Misery zaps in, and she also asks if you recognize her from before your first encounter in Mimiga Village. Then, Balrog comes in and states that Misery may be out of her league, to which Misery responds by telling him that we're his job anyways. She then curses him to become Balfrog. This fight can get hectic. He'll hop about the room, causing frogs to drop from the ceiling. You can use the air propellers at the end to, of the arena to launch yourself up and over him when he gets too close. Then, he'll open his mouth, revealing his weak spot and firing projectiles to conceal it. These projectiles can shield some damage from missiles, and more importantly, completely stop the bub bub line from sh shredding his health bar. Once his health gets low enough, he'll even summon more frogs from the ceiling. After being defeated, he turns back into Balrog and runs off like usual. Now we can get- now we can bring the materials to the robot and detonate the door to Kazuma. Once at Kazuma's, he says that with one look at us he knew he could do it. As to how he could have seen us from the crevice, I don't know, maybe he had his eye propped up there. But the room itself from the interior doesn't have a hole for him to see through. Kinda weird how that works. 
The dialogue mistakenly says that the teleporter was dead, but another person uses it to teleport in, and it still doesn't go back to the other end. There are one-way teleporters that you can use in the game, although this much could be chalked up to human error on Kazuma's part, rather than an issue with the script, because if Kazuma can't use it, he could just assume that it was dead, instead of assuming that it was a one-way teleporter. This new person that teleported in is Professor Booster. He explains to Kazuma that the doctor has started to, to round up the Mimiga in the village, and is currently looking for the red flowers to use on them. As to how we'll stop them, Professor Booster decides to instead tell us when everyone involved with this plan is around at Arthur's house. Kazuma and Booster also crash a jet bike. Very important. Back at the Mimiga village, Suze convinced the Mimiga to let her go, as the doctor wouldn't even trade her for Toroko, she'd just take her and probably the rest of the village too. This is because the Mimiga are to be used as weapons of death when fed the red flowers, as the red flowers don't kill Mimiga, but instead turn them into super weapons. Back at the Mimiga village, King, Kazuma, Booster, and Sue meet in Arthur's house. Sue is ready to leave the island from Egg Corridor, however, the escape plan must be put on hold for the time being, as the Doctor has found the location of the Red Flowers. This is an issue because not only are the Mimiga going to die, but the Doctor plans on attacking the surface outside of the island with them, rendering any escape plan unsafe. The Red Flowers are located in the Sand Zone, however, the Sand Zone is incredibly dangerous. But that's where we come in. But who exactly are we playing as? Well, that's Quote, a recon robot that's apparently been on this island for about 10 years. Our mission is to enter the sand zone and torch the red flowers before the doctor can get a hold of them. The sand zone already starts off more dangerous than we're used to at this point. If you fall on this platforming challenge at the start and anything below you is alive, it's going to hurt. There's also a residence with another robot and several Mimiga. However, we're mistaken for a killer robot by this lady and she pulls out a machine gun on us. This fight is rather simple, she walks around, fires the machine gun at whatever direction you are, and she'll even change direction to directly above her to the other side if you try jumping over her at the wrong time. The Mimiga will jump around and try and attack you, but you can momentarily disable them by firing at them. Also, the robot herself is immune to missiles, but she's also probably the most susceptible boss to the fireball, so it doesn't really mean much. Afterwards, everything gets explained as just a misunderstanding. Her name is Curly Brace, another robot also with memory loss, but instead of waking up in a cave, she's been over here raising little Mimiga. She also offers to trade your Polar Star for her machine gun. The machine gun has ammo like the Bubbling, a fast firing rate, and is pretty powerful. At level 3, it can also propel you vertically. However, there are better things to do with the Polar Star. There's also a dog. The next few rooms can be especially tricky to new players. You have to break the platforms with your weapons in a way that will let you platform forward, but also so you don't fall to the ground. Don't let the sun disc near you, and don't allow for yourself to fall down, as falling into the sand leads to getting snapped in half by a crocodile. In a particularly sandy pit, Misery appears, complaining about Balrog constantly failing, and she offers to fight us herself, however, Omega interrupts us. Omega is a giant antline-like creature that will emerge from the ground and erupt with cogs. Some of the cogs can be destroyed with firepower, and others can't, depending on their decal. Omega will also immediately submerge into the sand if shot with a missile, making missiles particularly useless in the first phase of the fight. After losing about half of its health, it'll start jumping around. You'll instantly die if you get crushed by it, so using the sandy dunes to your advantage, you can determine its jump height and determine how you should move forward to dodge it. After killing Omega, you'll be able to explore the rest of the sand zone. The lower section of it has a house with an old witch named Jenka. Talking to a Mimiga at the residence reveals that she may help you if you can find all her dogs. The dogs are around the map in rather creative ways that get you going around the sand zone and get you familiar with its layout and new parts that you'll be exploring. She'll also deliver some lore exposition if you bring her dogs back. She tries playing dumb about the red flowers when Balrog bursts in, asking for the key to the warehouse and where the red flowers are stored. She still tries playing dumb with him, but all this does is enrage him as he storms back to the doctor to report this. A new master. It must be another idiot added again. 
By the way, you must be another soldier from the surface. It's been a long time since all those robots, just like you, came to the island. They were responsible for the deaths of so many defenseless Mimiga, and for the brave men and women that tried to defend them. Due to the effects of the Forbidden Red Flower, the cornered Mimiga became utterly rabid. They fought back viciously against the robots that invaded their island. Who knows, perhaps had there been no Red Flower, it's very possible that the Mimiga on this island may have been annihilated. Have you ever seen an enraged Mimiga? Eating the flower will make me stronger. A great deal of the Mimiga believed this and chose to eat the red flower. Then, and only then, did they fight back against the battalions of robots. But do you know what happens afterwards to a Mimiga filled with such rage? It was so terrible. Perhaps they couldn't control themselves. Well, most of the Mimiga that consumed the red flower were never to be seen again. They went missing. I heard a rumor that they supposedly made it down to the surface, where the humans live. The thought of the enraged Mimiga anywhere close to the surface, with humans. If it's really true, do you realize it? Do you realize how dangerous the red flower actually is? Is it the warehouse key that you're after? The same warehouse that contains all the red flower seeds in it? It doesn't matter to me who you are, understand? I can't give you the key to the warehouse, sorry. Opening the warehouse would only be foolishly allowing an encore of the same tragedy from before. With this, we're not only exploring the island, but we're exploring its history, learning about who the robots were, what happened to this place before we came, and during our time here. We also get an understanding of why the red flowers are so important, and Jenka's seasoned view on them, and how dangerous they are, and why she, even though she doesn't want to give us the key, we need to find the flowers and we need to destroy them, given how horrifying the rabid Mimiga can be. Upon visiting Jenka with the last dog, Balrog's already busted in and stolen the key. All she asks is for you to stop him and to stop the doctor. She also gives you a life pot, which is an item that will refill your health once. You can also come back with the jellyfish juice and give it to her in exchange for another life pot, but you can only hold one at a time. The warehouse at this point is unlocked, with the doctor and Misery already inside. They teleport in Toroko, who, which begs the question of how they couldn't teleport into the warehouse, take the red flowers and teleport out. Anyways, the doctor has Balrog force feed Toroko a red flower. However, King steps in, beats Balrog with ease, then swears vengeance on the doctor. But the doctor stands unfazed as King rushes him, sending him to his death with a lightning bolt without so much as lifting his hands from his coat. Misery and the doctor leave right as we arrive, right in time for Toroko to turn rabid from the red flower. The fight against Toroko is the start of one of Cave Story's biggest difficulty spikes. The room is massive with slopes around it. Toroko also has a relatively small hitbox and jumps around a lot. This makes it hard to attack her with a rocket launcher or fireball, as you need to take into account where she's going to move, then if you miss, it's going to be a while before your projectile disappears, meaning you'll have to switch weapons and wait a bit before attacking again. The blocks she can throw are also very hard to dodge. She throws them directly at you, meaning you have to take into account the slope from Taroko's arm uh, to you, as well as the slants on the floor to find a proper way to dodge. Because she moves around so much, it's also hard to stack damage. All of these factors make Toroko's fight a test of endurance, where you can't just rush her down and you actually have to try your best to survive for a prolonged period of time. After putting her down, there's no fanfare. King's still alive, but in critical condition. The last thing he does is hand you the blade, his sword. Upon leaving, Balrog knocks us out, and Misery decides to warp us to the Labyrinth for being so pestilent. While she's at it, she sends Balrog there too, because why not? We wake up in the labyrinth. The only door out is locked, and these guys seem to have given up a while ago. To get out, we're going to have to do some extreme platforming. There are groups of small platforms around the place and purple critters. You need to take out the critters and navigate properly in order to not fall to the very bottom. Also, at this point you'll have King's Blade. The blade at level 1 is perfect for this part of the game, as it has the exact range to cover the distance between platforms and critters, while taking them out in a single hit. After getting high enough, some of the platforms will start moving to the left and right. They'll crush you if you're not careful. You'll have to carefully make sure you don't get crushed while also taking into account their movement to continue your ascent. 
After opening the door and leaving, another room becomes open with some more Crusher navigation challenges. Beyond that is another part of the labyrinth, with a bit more upbeat music, compared to the more methodically paced tracks of the previous rooms. Every music track in the labyrinth is a remix of Jenkins' theme, by the way. The reason for that will become much more apparent very soon. While we're here, I should talk about the blade. The blade's second level upgrade halves its range, but also halves its time between attacks, and makes it much bigger. Not too much to talk about here, but it is rather interesting how the properties aren't just being expanded on with these upgrades, but entirely changed, making the upgrades less of upgrades and more of complete overhauls. At level 3, it summons King's Spirit to cut up everything in its path and around the target. It strikes which can make damage on bigger targets rack up extremely fast. There's also a shop filled with some cockroach enemies from the rest of the labyrinth, except these ones aren't enemies, they're called Gaudis, and apparently they like to eat Mimiga. However, Janka banished them to live here in the labyrinth. Apparently the force that keeps this island floating in the sky also resides here somewhere. The shopkeeper says that all his supply has been taken, however. Depending on the status of your Polar Star, he can give you something interesting. If you have the machine gun, he'll give you an item that doubles ammo recharge speed. If you have a Polar Star, he'll offer to combine it with the Fireball to make something that fires similar to the Polar Star, phases through walls, and has the power and firing speed similar to the Fireball. However, there's something he has for you if you decide to keep the Polar Star and come back later. There's a camp around here with a physician and a nurse too, also curly on one of the beds. The physician can heal you, and he'll ask if you can grab some supplies from the clinic right above this one. The nurse says that there are ghosts over there too. Curly's a bit defeated due to failing to protect the Nimiga from misery. In the clinic, there's a boss fight against Pooh Black, a big black bar of soap. It'll jump down, sit there, and summon balls, and then jump right up. It's a very interesting fight. I, I find the atmosphere very surreal. He doesn't really make mon many sounds. In fact, it doesn't even have any fanfare or say anything when you defeat him. Instead, he just kind of waits a bit, then immediately jumps down to you. There's not really much of a wind-up to his attack. It makes the fight really surreal and kind of odd. It feels so weird to fight him. The treasure chest here contains the cure-all, which can be delivered to the physician, who will begin to administer it to Curly. Past this point is a platforming challenge with crushers, which is much easier with the machine gun than without it, as it requires near-perfect timing and maneuverability to not get crushed and reposition yourself on top of the crusher. Towards the exit, there's a giant mech followed by some Gaudi. If you venture too far past the mech, it'll spring into action and act as the boss here. This is Monster X. It'll roll around the arena before exposing itself and attacking at the same time. It has four brain-looking structures and its opening that must be taken out. They also fire projectiles that can absorb your shots. In order to not get ran over, which doesn't instantly kill you but will deal with lots of damage, you'll have to jump onto its treads, meaning you'll have to be precise with your positioning and timing as they move towards you and can bump you around while you're on them when Monster X stops or changes direction. Once all four cores are taken out, it'll start summoning little fish rockets to surround you while it's exposed. These are easy to dodge while it's stationary, but the moment it starts moving around, they get rather challenging to avoid. One way to kill them is to surround yourself in bubbles from the bubbling, but that only works if you're not riding Monster X, as the treads will just delete the bubbles on contact. The blade here works extremely well because it can not only rack up damage on Monster X's huge hitbox, but also it can destroy a lot of the projectiles very easily. In the next room, Professor Booster falls down quite a bit. Presumably he's been caught and teleported in by misery. If you fail to jump to the other door, you'll have no choice but to speak with him. In his dying moments, he ends up having a bit more pluck than one might expect. Because it turns out, in damning us to here, Misery spoiled the plans of the Doctor for good. There exists a life force in this labyrinth that holds the entire island afloat, and if it dies, then this island and everything on it will plummet. His last action is to give you the booster 0.8, which allows some limited mobility in the air. He then dies happy, knowing that at this point the Doctor's plot is all in folly. There's a sort of underdog pluck from the scene, where after being sent to his death, Professor Booster reflects on everything that led up to this moment, and sees what he describes as good fortune through all the mud and pain that he had to wade through to get here, like a dying soldier passing the torch onto you, the player. Also, if you look at the teleporter here, it isn't functional, but it says that a skilled teleporter technician could potentially use it. Anyways, this interaction is entirely optional through an understanding of how platforming in this game works, one can completely skip this if they just make the jump. The next room is the boulder chamber. 
where Curly's here somehow before us. Anyways, if we move this boulder, then we can leave. However, it's a tad too big for Quote and Curly to handle. That's when Balrog drops in. Not too keen on the idea of helping, and he says he's going to kill us. However, Curly completely ignores this and asks him to lift the boulder anyways. Which he goes to do, except he's actually going to kill us like he said he would. This time he'll run around, jump, and fire missiles. The missiles require quite a bit of damage to break, and between them and him jumping, Balrog can cover a lot of area with damage. After defeating him, he says he'll move the boulder if it's kept a secret from the Doctor in Misery. Balrog jumps away, leaving super missiles behind, and Curly points out the obvious that he may be one of the good guys. Thanks a ton, Curly. Very insightful. Super missiles are also an upgrade for the missile launcher. Basically, it's a faster and stronger missile launcher that will turn anything, be it enemy or the final boss, into mincemeat within seconds. Next is the final stretch of the labyrinth. Set to some upbeat music that isn't a remix of Janka's theme, this time as Quote and Curly rush their way to the exit. Something interesting about this area is it contains use cases for just about every weapon you have so far. Missiles, the fireball, bubbling, and the blade. But these use cases can be done with other weapons in case Monster X or Balrog leveled them down a bit. There's also a lot of XP to prepare you for what's after this. The platforming here uses water as a way to keep the individual corridors smaller, so more can be fit in the room without stretching its size too big, while also forcing you back if you fail a jump. Beyond the last corridor of the area, there's a dark space. Curly asks if this is even part of the labyrinth at this point, which is a good question because it stands in such contrast to the rest of the area. Just what is this place? Apparently, it's called the Core. To progress in it, you'll need to activate DOS command prompt nodes. There's a tow rope at the very bottom of this room. It's very important that you grab it. At the top, Curly seems to have found a killer robot from a decade ago. There's a ton like it scattered about the room. Something very powerful has made its mark here. This robot here seems to be operational to a certain degree. It says that whatever target it was tasked with eliminating was too strong for its team to handle. That's when the door locks behind you and the core awakens. The core fight is the second biggest difficulty spike in the game. During the fight, the miniature cores around it will fire projectiles. They can also be pushed backwards by getting hit. So will the core itself when it exposes its face. However, it'll start by shrouding itself in miniature cores, then will conceal itself again after a couple of seconds. This gives you a very short time window to actually attack it. The rest of the time can be dedicated to staying alive, collecting resources, and positioning yourself to attack the core when it becomes vulnerable again. The gravity from the water combined with the core's onslaught of attacks can end up forcing you underwater and potentially even drowning you if you're not careful. Additionally, one of the core's attacks causes a water current to push you to the left, which can pin you in some extremely uncomfortable positions, especially when it follows up by firing spears that deal huge amounts of damage. The core is in complete control of this fight. It's a completely domineering force. Between concealing itself and being behind or in platforms, it can sidestep being rushed down with missiles. It also controls the water supply in the room. If you're too reckless in trying to rush it down, you could potentially drown as between the current and water, you can get pinned underwater for extended periods of time without being able to get air. You have to balance your survival and killing the core to survive the fight long enough to win. Ironically enough, the snake is actually one of the best weapons for this fight, as it has one of the longest ranges out of any weapon, is very fast, ignores wall collision, and deals about as much damage as a fireball. The core fight is all about platforming, maintaining yourself, positioning, and rushing down the core when possible. After killing the core, Curly rhetorically asks, you did it? Which further emphasizes something the player should have picked up on, which is that the core is an extremely oppressive force. She's almost shocked that we managed to kill it, and honestly, so was I. This is further emphasized by its theme, oppression, which conveys how much of a brutal force it is. Misery warps in, shocked and enraged that this happens. She gets too distracted by how much she hates robots because of the core being defeated, but the Doctor has to warp in himself and scold her. His remarks and tone display an intense level of importance that Misery immediately warps the core to the lab to stop it from dying, instead of spending time harassing Curly and quote. It's a great scene. Afterwards, the room floods, and you end up about to drown when... Did you know that the woman named Jenka had a younger brother? His name was Balos. Like his older sister, he possessed magical powers unlike anyone could imagine. We wake up with Curly's air tank installed and Curly sitting there comatose. With the tow rope, if we picked that up before the fight, we can take her with us. For some reason, you can't pick it up after the fight even though it's still there. I, I don't get it. So you have to make sure you grab it before you fight the core. The lion head exit from earlier is open to us now. It's also what flooded the core's room, clearly. 
we can enter it to get into the waterway. This place is a nice and relaxing cooldown after dragging ourselves through the labyrinth and the hell that was fighting the core. Not hell in that we had a bad experience, but more so that it was extremely difficult and grueling for an extended period of time. The current pushing you near spikes that you have to use your reaction time to avoid feels almost like a roller coaster. The most important part of the waterway is the, this jump right here. You have to not fall into the current below and you have to reach the safe house. In here, the song Pulse plays, a relaxing and intimate song that feels like despite all the hurt and pain out there, it'll end up alright. Everything will be okay, we just need to calm down and take a break. Speaking of doing so, that's what the computer monitor in this room says. I mentioned this when we got the map, and I'm going to start expanding upon it now, but there is a question of who is on the other side of this computer. The, this entity is never named, but they're guiding us through the game somehow. How about taking a break for now? That reminds me, I also recorded some findings in that notebook. On the bookshelf is a dusty notebook, with instructions on how to service flooded robots. Using this information, we can save Curly. After doing so, there's one more message in the monitor. You can do it. Anyways, we can take Curly with us and continue forth. There's a boss fight here against Ironhead, a big fish. This fight's pretty fun to me because of how unique it is. You have free movement while they're floating in the water. Ironhead and the school of pufferfish will come up from behind you alongside some bricks. Then they'll fall back. The pufferfish at this point will also turn their needles out. Also, if you beat it without taking a hit, a school of Ika will follow you, and you'll get an Ika medallion. Afterwards, you wake up in Mimiga Village, but something's odd. The music is mysterious and foreboding, and nobody's here. The entire place has been cleared out. Arthur's house is empty too, except for Booster, if you didn't grab the Booster 0.8. By now, the doctor has finished collecting the red flowers and gathered every Mimiga on the island. Booster's upgraded the Booster to the Booster 8 2.0, and gives it to us. His last request is for us to escape with Sue. With the booster, we can make it back to the first cave and talk to the gunsmith. He's awake this time. He asks if we've seen whoever took the gun he made before realizing that we have it. He takes it back, saying that he didn't make it for us. A question that could arise at this point is, who did he make it for? To him, a weapon should be made and used by the same person. Anyone who uses something they never constructed doesn't deserve to do so, for they can never appreciate what went into making it, but instead only the power that it can output. However, in seeing the amount of wear that Quote has put on it, it has caused him to see things differently. In his use of the Polar Star, he's developed as much of an appreciation for using it as the gunsmith has for making it. Because of this, he offers to give it back, after it's finished. Now we're given the Spur, or the Polaris. The Polaris doesn't take XP, instead you charge it up to then fire off a laser. It can have three potential charges. Also, if you go back to the labyrinth and talk to the shopkeeper, He'll give you a thing that causes three stars to orbit you when you get a full charge. It's mostly cosmetic because you're adding a twinkle stars to a laser gun. Back at Arthur's house, the computer has a message from Kazuma on it. Teleport to the egg corridor. In the egg corridor, something has happened. Apparently, a gigantic explosion rocked the entire place, destroying most of the architecture and rearranging the entire map. The maps become less uniform and way less cluttered with large stretches for boosting around the place becoming open. 
However, you need to be careful where and how you boost forward, as spikes on the ceiling will fall on top of you. Some of the eggs have also hatched improperly, creating zombie dragons. There's also an optional boss fight against two of them. The reward is a Missile Max extension. In the Egg Observatory room, you find Kazuma, who explains everything that happened up until this point. Right after we left for the Sand Zone, Kazuma, Booster, and Sue started preparing an escape. However, Misery appeared, kidnapped Sue, and sent Booster to the Labyrinth. Kazuma managed to escape her again, and fled to the Egg Corridor to hatch the Dragon Egg there. He's come to peace with the fact that the Doctor is unstoppable by our firepower at this point. His plan was perfect, and it was all in folly to try and stop it in the first place. He'll only be growing more and more powerful with the flowers in Mimiga. However, with the dragon that Kazuma hatched, you and him can escape. He then offers an escape to you. If you say yes, that's it. You leave, the Doctor wins, you and Kazuma seclude yourself in the mountains, somewhere he'll never think to look while assaulting the rest of the planet. If you say no, Kazuma, well, truth be told, there's another way to change the Mimiga back to their original state. Destroying the island's core. Of course, doing so would result in their deaths, your death, and a lot of other collateral damage. But it's better than damning the rest of us, isn't it? Kazuma also says that he'll still be here as an escape, but he'll leave if things start getting too hectic. This is the outer wall. It's beautiful, isn't it? It overlooks the entire world, the edge of the island. It's relaxing, soothing, a calm before the storm, the storm of course being confronting the doctor. Also, if you've done everything right so far, you'll be able to enter the clock room, where you can get the 290 counter. Something's inscribed on it. This I present to you, the challenger, in anticipation of your determination. Show me your best. The rest of the outer wall is a soothing ascent to the top of the island. It's one of the most visually mesmerizing locales in the entire game. The soundtrack, uh, Moon Song, also perfectly complements this. Using the booster, you can platform your way however you wish to get to your, the desired location, which is the top of the outer wall, making it a really open map, as you can really maneuver however you want. Then we get to the plantation, the last major area of the game. You know it's serious when the title screen music starts playing. The plantation is my personal favorite location of this game. It's so large and expansive, and just about everything you need or can do in it is non-linear, so you can do it in however order you really want. For example, you can find Curly here, there's also Cthulhu, one of the island's natives right beside her. According to him, she has memory loss, but it can be cured with a special mushroom. Not very informative? Not exactly true. There's only one part of the game where a mushroom is accessible, the Mimiga Cemetery. In the cemetery, there's a room only accessible via the booster or machine gun. In there, there's a mushroom named Ma Pignon, who offers you the mushroom badge. That's cool and all, but this isn't what we came here for. We came here for the mushroom, not the badge. So, you threaten to eat Ma Pignon, and he decides to fight you. The fight's pretty simple. You kill him. Also, in the cemetery, there's a little guy in the grass. If you spoke to his family in the Outer Wall previously, you can grab him, take him back to the Outer Wall, and potentially trade the blade for the Nemesis. The Nemesis fires lightning bolts that deal colossal amounts of damage with a very high DPS. However, if you get a single XP point, it levels up and becomes worse, culminating in level 3, where it's a reskinned level 1 bubbline that fires rubber ducks. Back in the plantation, we can talk to Curly. After giving her the mushroom, she remembers everything, even before she was in the sand zone. The two of you were sent to the surface for the incredible slumbering power found on this island. Whether that's the core, red flowers, or demon crown, not very clear. However, you and Curly were sent to destroy whatever that power was. The mission ended the moment the doctor took the demon crown. Curly tried to stop him, and so did you. But whatever thrashing he gave the two of you was enough to give you both memory loss. So, that's how that went. She also gives you the Iron Bond, which is important for later. Another thing we can do is go to jail. Oh, also, side note about that previous thing. It just says that someone took the Demon Crown. That could have actually been the last guy who took the Demon Crown, because the Demon Crown actually gets passed down to different holders. And since we've been here for 10 years, it actually probably wasn't the Doctor who took the Demon Crown. Anyways, another thing we can do is go to jail. There's a teleporter room where we get thrown in jail by this guy here. In jail, Sue tries to wake us up, but is taken elsewhere before then. When we come to, we can open some mail she gave us, which tells us the complete story of what happened to her, Cosma and Booster. Them and a few others came to this island, along with the doctor, who at the time was just a medical expert. However, he only tagged along because he wanted the demon crown, something that would grant the wearer immense magical power and control over the island. He forced the group to continue research under him. 
Some escaped, but most were killed once they served their use. The last thing in the note is a password to enter a hidden section of the plantation, in case Sue's mother is still alive in there. We can find the hideout, and in there, Sue's mother, Momorin Sakamoto, explains that she was cast out by the doctor since he found the flower seeds. She also has a plan to take him down. She's going to build a rocket that will send us to the surface of the island, directly where the doctor is. However, she needs some parts, the first of which is your booster. Yeah, it'll be gone for the next 20 minutes or so. The second of which is electricity harvested from a functioning sprinkler. The Mimiga working in the plantation are forbidden from speaking with humans, which some of them mistake us for. Um, so to get a sprinkler, we're going to have to become a plantation worker. So Quote is going to do his best impersonation of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We get the sprinkler, see some of the Mimiga from places we've been to, and see that they've been imprisoned here, and then we take the sprinkler back to Momorin. Around the plantation, we're also able to get some insight of what's happening. A good portion of the Mimiga believe killer robots are still out there, and the doctor's making them stronger by having them grow red flowers. Some others know what the actual reason behind the red flowers are. These ones have been put in prison, begrudgingly work anyways, or will be found in the doctor's lab, being prepared for experiments. A good portion of them also just don't care, and they're just working so they don't get killed. Somehow, through these rabbit creatures, Daisuke Amaya has managed to perfectly convey the effects of propaganda and a mix of opinions and reasoning in a population, making these Mimiga and by proxy the world they're in seem even more real and immersive. The next thing we need to do is get a remote from an engineer named Ito. Apparently, he's a cowardly oaf who was the first to successfully run from the doctor, but most likely didn't get very far. And it just so happens that the cowardly oaf at the entrance of the plantation is Ito. We get the remote and bring it back to Momorin, who says it'll take a bit to finish the rocket, so we have to go to sleep, wake up, and then Momorin and Ito have set it all up for us. From there, she gives us our booster back, takes the Mimiga mask, and we're all set. Now, you can continue exploring the world and do really whatever you want, or you can ascend to the final stretch of the game and take on the Doctor. There could be some items you missed, or maybe you haven't done all the side missions like the one with Curly, or you have second thoughts about trading the blade with, with the Nemesis and want the Nemesis now. Anyways, let's go forth. Oh, also, Jenka sent a dog to give us a health extension. Very important. The last gauntlet before the Doctor's throne is the final cave. A fitting juxtaposition to the first cave, with a fittingly opposing red and navy color scheme, as opposed to the light blue and navy color scheme from the first cave. This place is drastically different depending on if you have the booster 2.0 or not. The main thing is the area gains a lot of more booster maneuverability, using it to navigate around and through obstacles in specific ways, if you have the booster 2.0. Your weapons also drop to level 1 the moment you enter, meaning you're almost at square 1 while playing this. You need to decide which weapons you probably will need to use and level them up accordingly. Health is also placed around the place, but rather scarce considering the potential damage you'll be taking from the spikes leading there. If the plantation represents the apex of exploration and progression in Cave Story, then the final cave is the apex of uh, putting your skills to work. Maneuverability and overall combat skill take absolute priority here. There are so many things placed around here, like health pickups, platforms, XP pickups, and there are near infinite strategies available for the player at any given point. There is also a boss fight against the Red Ogre. He jumps and fires a ton of projectiles. They cover a lot of area, and the room's rather cramped. It's mostly about booster navigation and timing when you can hit him as he moves around. After him is a ton of rooms that emphasize timing and execution of just boosting forward. There's some blood droplets that you have to time, and some presses that you have to boost past, but be careful when you get past them or else you might get hit by something in front of your path. Or you could just kill all the presses with the bubline or whimsical star. <coughs> After the final cave, you can finally emerge at the surface of the island, and from here we can reflect. We can reflect upon how far we've come, starting in a cave at the very bottom of the island, to sitting atop it all. It's another relaxing breather before the finale, the final fight versus the Doctor. There's some resources here, rabid Mimiga to kill, I suppose the Doctor's began his experiments, and we can also read Professor Booster's memo. Then we can enter the throne room. Misery's here, waiting for us. The fight against her starts out pretty basic. She teleports around, summons some magic, and repeats. As she takes damage, she ramps her attacks up in strength. For starters, she'll start summoning lightning balls that will zap you when you get under them. They do not disappear, requiring you to position under them and run or boost past them while avoiding Misery's other attacks. 
Her attacks include dropping a brick on you and summoning bats. Rings will also surround her, forcing you to wait for her to become open before shooting at her. This fight requires you to analyze the layout perfectly, then dodge attacks, gauge the timing and positioning of the rings, then attack Misery. After defeating her, we can ascend to the King's Table, where the Doctor is. He's telling us about the science behind the red flowers, it brings out latent abilities, and destroys the reasoning of one consuming it. He's extracted the compounds with these properties and amplified them, condensing the result into the red crystal. What's different about this crystal is that it also works on humans. He then uses this crystal to amplify his magic and fights with us. In this fight, the Doctor will teleport about the room, then fire off rotating projectiles at you. The projectiles move more and cover more area as they progress, sort of like Death and Albus' attacks from Castlevania Order of Ecclesia. What's different about the Doctor's attacks is that they also block projectiles, so does the crystal orbiting him. This requires you to position and time your attacks must much more precisely. For example, the super missile launcher is practically useless during this, the first phase of this fight as a result, and the Polaris lasers can easily get mostly or entirely blocked. The Nemesis, however, fires very fast projectiles that can be very useful in this fight. After he's defeated, the Red Crystal goes berserk, transforming him into the Muscle Doctor. He'll still teleport, but he'll also now use physical attacks and much stronger magic. However, compared to the methodical and planned out movements of the Doctor, the Muscle Doctor is a lot more primal and brash, pouring whatever power he can into his attacks without much thought behind it. After he's killed, he disintegrates and the Crystal floats off by itself. We can ascend one last time to the black space, where the core is being held. Now we can finally grab Sue and leave this all behind. Misery finds her first, however. She holds Sue hostage and demands that the core be spared in exchange for her life, and quote, leaving the island. However, someone demands that such negotiations be stopped. It's the doctor. He's still alive. The red crystal was too much for his mortal body to handle, but through it, his consciousness has ascended far beyond such limits. Misery tries to destroy him, but he's not even corporeal at this point, and as such, he can't even be harmed. He possesses Misery, then when Sue tries to leave, he possesses her. Then the core awakens. The final battle is everything to be expected from a finale. It challenges everything you've developed at this point. There are three enemies in total here. Misery, who will summon fish missiles, bats, and critters that must be dodged or killed and will get in your way on the land and in the air. Sue, who will follow you and attempt a screw attack into you. And the core, which behaves similar to how it did in its first encounter, firing projectiles, exposing itself, and firing off spherical death occasionally. The mini cores that surround it can also be used as platforms. This fight challenges everything you know at this point. Platforming, combat, timing, movement, all of it. It also has an excellent and epic final boss theme. With the core dead once again, the effects of the red flower dissipate. Sue and Misery are cured, and the Doctor's life force dissipates too. We escape on a helicopter with Momoren, Ito, and Sue when... Wait, no we don't. They leave without us. So we take a leap of faith. Better than getting crushed, I suppose. Kazuma catches the two of us, thankfully. We're all safe, but the island and everything on it, not so much. But wait, there's another way here. Right after killing the core, while escaping, you can enter the prefab house, but only if you've been given the iron bond from Curly. Everything's collapsing, including the floor of this house, which leads to the entrance of the true final area of the game the Bloodstained Sanctuary. This is the true final cave. Forget everything I said about the actual final cave. This area is the culmination of everything you have learned in this game. It is the hardest area in the entire game, and the highest difficulty spike. While venturing through it, you're told the story. The same one that we heard the start of in the Core's room. Did you know that the woman named Jenka had a younger brother? His name was Balos. And like his sister, he possessed magical powers that no man had. He led and protected the people with his magical power. They loved and trusted him, even more than their own king. Jealous of Balos, the resentful king caught and imprisoned him. His punishments were severe and cruel. 
humans truly are terrible creatures. Balos was driven into a state of pure, uncontrollable rage by the punishment. Weakened by the torture, he was helpless to contain the fury. The king and his kingdom were swallowed by Balos's magical force. The life that he loved so dearly was turned into ruins in a single night, shrouded only by fiery hot ashes. Driven insane by his punishment, Balos was confined to the floating island in the sky by his sister, Jenka. For that was all she could do, for Jenka killing her own younger brother would be impossible. Jenka's witch daughter, Misery, is to blame for the demon crown. She forced Balos to create it. Because of this offense, she was cursed by the crown, compelled to obey whoever possesses it. The curse can only be lifted if the demon crown is destroyed. However, the demon crown will be restored anew an infinite amount of times, so long as Balos's heart still beats. That is the supreme magical power of his eternally enraged soul. It is intrinsically imbued into his evil creation, the Demon Crown. At the end of the Bloodstained Sanctuary, a dog's apparition is here. He asks us to kill his master, Balos, in order to free misery and stop future tragedies in the same vein as this one. It's happened before, and it will happen again and again and again, so long as the Demon Crown exists. When confronting Balos, he'll speak of the events that led him being shackled to this island him destroying his entire kingdom. He says his wife and child were, de were devoured by the fires of his tortured soul. Something that stuck out to me was a theory a friend of mine in the sixth grade posed about five years ago. When we first read that, he observed and theorized that the dog from earlier is the manifestation of the child that was killed by him. Now, he wasn't necessarily a dog, that's more of an avatar he represents himself as while talking to us. Sort of like how a dog can symbolize loyalty and childlike wonder. Now for the fight against Balos. The fight starts with him performing a very simple pattern of charging towards you, moving up, moving back, then crashing down. This is entirely about getting into rhythm and blasting him when he's open. Afterwards, he'll start floating and firing bolts of lightning at a precise location. This must be dodged with fast booster maneuvering and most importantly, reaction speed. Now for phase two. I remember the first time I ever beat Bloodstained Sanctuary and got to Balos. It was, again, the 6th grade, and I was playing Cave Story 3D on my modded 2DS. Which, by the way, took forever to find a real Cave Story 3D download, by the way. I ended up downloading a virus at one point, but it was for Windows and it was using Mint Linux at the time, so... <laughs> yeah, stuff happens. Uh, if you ever want a video on the sheer craziness that was Cave Story 3D development and gameplay, please mention that in the comments, by the way. Anyways, I kept not getting it because I was like 11, but the same, but the same friend of mine that pointed out the uh, the dog thing, he pointed out that every third jump Balos makes, he stops for an extended period of time. With this knowledge, one can maneuver around Balos and make sure not to get pinned or crushed. Charge up a level three Polaris laser, go up to his eye and destroy him. Rinse and repeat a couple times, and now for the actual final battle. The main point of this phase is position. You have to position yourself so you don't get crushed by the eyes surrounding Balos and don't get sniped by the skulls they drop. After demolishing every one of Balos' surrounding eyes, he goes to the center of the map, spawns several rotating platforms, and forms spikes on the floor. This portion of the boss focuses on pretty much everything, dodging aerial combat, platforming, boosting, and timing. Either to hit the open eyes to create more openings to attack, or just attacking Balos himself. There are so many things going on in this fight, it pushes you and pulls the best performance out of you. Cherubs swarm you and occasionally strike from one side to another. You need to kill them or dodge them by the, uh, going above. Um, the platforms are never going to be in a friendly position for you. You always have to be mindful of them, where they are, and how you're going to boost back to them after you're done jumping. To do whatever attack or dodge you were planning on doing. A good spot to shoot Balos is right above him. However, that's where the cherubs spawn from, so you have to be extra conscious about that. The platforms also move. You'll have to take into account where they will be whenever you leave them to dodge an eyeball or a cherub. The player can reasonably expect where they'll be heading, because they orbit Balos in, a, in an entirely consistent pattern. Each of these phases in the Bloodstained Sanctuary are designed not only to push you to your limits, but do so consecutively. You'll be worn down on ammo and health at this point, so much so that you'll barely be alive to dodge what's left. Thankfully, the cherubs drop health, and so do all the enemies in this encounter. And after going through hell and back, Balos' hate and madness are quelled. The island even stops falling too. 
Curly comments about how the negative energy of being destroyed may have stopped the island falling. Essentially, the implication is that Balos and the Demon Crown were too strong for the island to handle, so Jenka had to create the Labyrinth, and it's implied that she also created the core to keep the island afloat. But with the core destroyed but Balos alive, the island would crumble. But with both dead, then the island would return to way back before any of that happened. However, while Balos may have been killed, he's not down and out completely. At least not yet. So hot. Can't breathe. He's dying, but still has some form of being left. With, when all seems lost, Balrog comes to save us. Why didn't Balrog of all people come to our rescue? Well, he and Misery were cursed by the Demon Crown to obey whoever wore it. But with the crown destroyed, they're free to do whatever. Curly and Balrog discuss this as they're flying off. Now that everything's over, Balrog asks Curly what she's gonna do. She says she wants to live somewhere with a nice view. Then he asks if he can tag along, and Balrog, Curly, and quote, fly off. An uplifting and lighthearted ending for sure. One that I find to be perfect in just about every way. We're given some credits, which each of the characters involved and some artwork of different parts of the game. Truly an ending worth remembering. And we're also given some little scenes of everyone after the island collapses. They're humorous and lighthearted, just like the lighter parts of the game's tone. An excellent extension of them. The end, thank you for playing. There's some post-game content, like a Curly story where you play as Curly and some challenges. The challenges are small maps where you're given a certain set of weapons and items to complete with. They're honestly quite fun and can help you develop an appreciation for a lot of mechanics you wouldn't normally use, like the machine gun or booster 0.8. They can also reinvigorate a lot of the feelings from playing the game originally, like the egg challenges wonder and exploration, the sand pits grueling and dungeon-like layout, and the sheer awe and beauty of the wind fortress. So what is the cave story all about? Well, it's about a lot of things. It's about war, love, duty, death. The story is laid out in a way that keeps you with some burning questions. Something that isn't quite answered yet, and, it pro and as it progresses, those questions are answered by explaining not just what's in front of us, not what we're progressing through, the exact areas we are in, such as the Doctor's plan, the red flowers, the core, etc. But also, what's behind us? The backstory of this world. Why we're here. Why everything is here. Why the Doctor's here. Why the island and everything on it is the way that it is. The world building of Cave Story is phenomenal. This world is alive. From how the characters interact with each other, their unique and charming personalities, to how they react to the environment and things that change around them. Like Booster and Kazuma, who want you to get the warehouse key to destroy the Red Flowers, but Janka, who's a veteran of the cruelty of the Red Flowers and Demon Crown since their inception, and has become so jaded to anyone who wants to go near them that she refuses to let even you enter the warehouse, despite your allegedly altruistic goals. Or the Mimiga indoctrinated at the plantation. Some of them fall for the propaganda from the Doctor, others, like the ones from Mimiga Village, are either starkly against it, or don't believe it, and are indifferent. Some of them know what a robot is and think you're a killer robot, others were never affected by the robot invasion, and so they don't care, some even think you're a human. Rumors and misunderstandings also spread, like how some cultures interpret things around the world with a different understanding, or some people just lose things in translation as they're telling th each other things, like the Mimiga in the Mimiga village who think the red flower will just kill them. Meanwhile, Sue knows the actual effect of the red flower. Using this world building and expanding upon it in the just the right ways, with just the right pacing of doing so, Cave Story's plot manages to be very endearing, interesting, and in intricately written. One thing of particularly importance is the use of tone. Most of Cave Story's story and settings are rather upbeat, cutesy, and rather funny at times. However, Daisuke knows exactly when things need to be shifted, like when we're fighting the core, interacting with the Doctor, and in literally any location that plays the song Pulse. The Doctor in particular manages to be a threat to the player whenever, because his very mention changes the tone of any given scene. He's never undercut by comedy or lighthearted banter, because he's only mentioned or shown in scenes with a more serious tone. Because of this, he manages to avoid the Marvel effect and be domineering and threatening as a force throughout the entire game's storyline. You don't see him at first, you only hear of him. When you do see him, he's in complete control. Everyone's at his mercy, and anything that tries to stand up to him is cast aside within an instant.
Cave Stories plot can really do it all. It can be happy-go-lucky, serious, depressing, and uplifting. All when it needs to be. Something that helps achieve this is the locales. The locations, their palettes, the enemies, and especially their music. Every location is distinct in these ways. From both versions of the Egg Corridor, to the Bushlands, Sand Zone, Plantation, you get it. They all have different ways you can go about exploring them, which can greatly contribute to replay value. Alongside their sequestered off optional areas, where you can find missile increases, health increases, the whole nine yards. I love exploring in each and every one of these locations, although I do wish that the bushlands didn't overload on missile increases so much. There's two right next to each other here. I would have preferred it if they just put the next second missile increase in like the sand zone of the labyrinth even. This would also make Balfrog a bit harder to cheese with pure rocket spam. The music in Cave Story is some of the best I've heard in a video game. It perfectly conveys every area of the game, and you can really feel the emotion put behind every track. The music honestly makes a lot of these areas that much better. The fast and furious beats of the sand zone, the even faster and more furious melody of running hell in the bloodstained sanctuary, and the wonder and mystique of the outer walls moon song, and the core's geothermal really convey the range of tones that the music and by extension the areas they represent can contain. These are some of the best, most memorable, and most diverse locations in a video game. They're all memorable and worth remembering in their own right. Now let's get sentimental here. Upon relinquishing the polar star to the gunsmith, he says, There remains a very delicate balance of those who create and those who will experience their creations. This is not only in reference to our use of the polar star, but is also a commentary on creating art. There's a very fine balance between creating art and experiencing art, with both artists and art consumers overlapping in roles and requiring each other. Someone experiencing media requires the creator of that media to create it and produce it, and the creator should, not, should want nothing more than people to experience and appreciate what they've created, even if some people cannot fully appreciate everything that goes into it. This is what artistic expression is at its core, not a media conglomerate trying their hardest to appeal to the broadest audiences by feeding into stale and repetitive expectations, or a career artist making things solely for the prospect of being paid to make them. Instead, art is at its purest when its intention is solely for the creators of it to express themselves for the sake of others to appreciate it. Now let's talk about that entity from earlier. I've talked about it previously, but let's go into more depth. I mentioned that I think the entity is, or at least is representative of Daisuke Amaya speaking to the player, guiding them throughout his game to get the true experience of Cave Story. He does this by not only guiding them, but by giving them something else they need. Something a lot of us need, actually. Encouragement. After he sets us on the right course, he stops directly guiding us, like an artist setting someone off to experience their work for themselves. Past this point, he only has one thing to say to us. You can do it. Then, as we're climbing the outer wall before the ending of the game, show me your best. Perhaps as we're sitting here, playing video games, writing, watching YouTube videos, working, studying, what we really need is someone there for us. Someone who can set us on our own in anticipation that we won't give up. Who can assure themselves and us that we'll do our best out there. <laughs> what would I know? Hey guys. Thanks for checking out the video. Um, I don't really know what to say, but uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, I will have more videos eventually. The uh, next one's gonna be Metroid Zero Mission. That, that can't be too hard. It might be Symphony. No, it's not gonna be Symphony. But it's gonna be Zero Mission, so. <laughs> Hopefully that works. Oh my god, the glare. Kids are nice. Um, yeah, thanks for watching and. Whatever you may be doing right now, you can do it. 